Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Um, not sure it's morning where you are because this is uh, us presenting around the world about an update of what's happening here at Henners. So um, currently, today is the 29th of September, if you're watching this back on the recording, and social media is full of pictures of uh, people harvesting grapes and uh, wines being made. We are a little bit um, away off that um, right now, being in England, being in a cool climate, but um, we really wanted to give you an update on what's happening with regards to Henners. We've made a lot of changes, uh, a lot of investment, a lot of improvements, and also how the season is going so far. Um, this is a very much a working winery, and we are in the middle of some uh, quite extensive renovations and improvements. So if you do hear some loud bangs and clattering and, and noises, that's because um, we've got builders in uh, still uh, in, installing equipment and uh, getting ready for what's going to be a, a busy harvest. But I'm really uh, delighted to be here and um, my name's Mike Best, so I'm here to uh, post this little update um, on, on Henners and introduce a few of the teams. So uh, on my right, I have Colette O'Leary, who is the um, chief winemaker here and the estate manager. So um, Colette is the is the, the sort of the, the uh, driving force behind Henners. And uh, Rebecca Apley, who is the uh, new cellar door manager. So we will um, get into that as well. Uh, not present is um, Sam Williams, who's the assistant winemaker, um, who's just recently joined us, and Will Robinson, who is the vineyard manager. So we've got that's the, the sort of the update of the of the team at Henners, and we also have Tom Whiteley, commercial manager, uh, who is um, yeah just waving his hand there. So hello to Tom <laughs> up, up, up north, um, and that's the the sort of the, the expansion of <clears throat> of Henners and 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 who we are, but still uh, very much framed within the the wider bootnose family but Hen is becoming its its own its own entity um, we were really pleased um, to kick off with uh, some uh, awards that we've won so we've um, had some some good success at the uh, wine GB awards we had a fantastic tasting in London just a few weeks ago where all the industry was able to get together and uh, and show the wines and and uh, wish everyone a, a, a good harvest and uh, actually catch up with each other after the last sort of 18 months. But we won some awards from the Wine, G Wine GB Awards. Um, we've uh, won some from the, um, the IWEA and uh, that's just on the back of um, some earlier success from IWSC, IWC. So it's really encouraging to see those coming through. I mean, I don't think Henners to go chasing awards. It's just a recognition for uh, a lot of a lot of hard work and showing that actually this is a style of wine and quality that people are excited about about drinking. So um, what we're going to kick off with then, I think, is that um, the a, a run through of the of the season. So um, this year throughout Europe has been um, an interesting time in terms of in terms of um, making wine. There's been all sorts of challenges, but within that and for the right reasons, I think there's been um, a lot of a lot of positivity um, as well. So um, I think that um, though we've had primarily a, a fairly cool season in, in England, it's going to be um, really interesting in terms of what we can what we can get out of it. So um, we're going to ask Colette if we can have a, um, a quick run through of the sort of chronology of the of the, of the growing season. So um, there was quite a lot of starting at the at, at frost, um, there was as being an issue. There was quite a lot of frost in the UK, but um, how did we get on here with, um, with with that, and how was our site helpful for that? Uh, yeah, so um, the frost is one of the biggest challenges for England. We typically kind of you can get late frost into April and May. Um, the Henna site is actually near sea level, um, and we overlook to kind of it's difficult sitting in this little box yeah. not to to imagine, <laughs> but we overlook the uh, the Pevensey levels, and so. We're, we're, we've got a slope that comes off. And so actually, as the cold air hits, it, it drains off the slope across yeah. what's called the Pevensey Levels. And so it basically means we're not a frost risk site. Yeah. Um, also, we're really near, we're only five kilometres from the sea. And that kind of constant movement and air and what we call our coastal influence yeah. um, does mean that the frost doesn't tend to, to affect us. Mm -hmm. So we got off to a good start this season because it was a bit of a, we had a cold spring. Yeah. Um, it was a bit of a slow start, and and there were late frosts, and it wasn't just us. I know it hit parts of France as well. Yeah. Um, but actually, as a site here, and most of our growers actually, we 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 come through it well, and we were yeah, we were fine. Yeah. So that's that's an, uh, a piece of encouraging news because um, you may well have seen um, old reports from 
from France and, and Northern Italy um, with some some really large frost events, which have been uh, very difficult for a number of growers throughout throughout Europe. And so uh, England being a being a cool climate certainly is at risk of that. But it's um, just one of the, the great things about this site. And we're you know very pleased that that didn't um, didn't affect us as too much. Um, and then as uh, things progressed, how was it in terms of uh, fruit set and and, and um, uh, sort of sorry, flowering and moving further into the season? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, 2021, I think, is going to go down as one of the challenging yeah. vintages, to be fair. Um, 2020 was like hot and sunny and we were all locked in our houses. And yeah. then 2021, has, we've been out, but it has been more of a challenge. Um, we had a we had the frost. Then we moved into kind of cold April, cold May, a bit of a wet June. Yeah. Um, but having said that, we we have escaped the worst of it. Uh, again, we're quite fortunate. The weather, we are in the one of the driest, sunniest pockets of, of England, yeah. um, which is not necessarily a contradiction in, in yeah. terms. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and and because we are near the coast, the weather tends to move through pretty pretty quickly. So because um, we're near sea level as well, we're a slightly warmer site. So actually this year we went through flowering a couple, well, a few days before other people and so we missed the worst of the bad weather at that time. Yeah. Typically in England, we will flower around about the end of June. Mm -hmm. Um, usually coincides with Wimbledon tennis fortnight. Um, and so this year was a bit dodgy on the weather. Yep. The roof was closed at Wimbledon a bit. And so it was slightly dodgy weather for flowering. But actually we got um, we got good fruit set. We've got a lot of crop out there. Um, summer was okay. We've had periods of really hot, dry, sunny weather. And then we've had periods of rain yep. and wind. But actually as the season's gone on, we've been, yeah, we've been okay. And then September has come along and we've had a lovely spring a couple of weeks of, of hot sunny weather which has kind of given the the vines a much needed boost towards the end of the of the season so we there has been disease pressure this year uh, it's not just in england i know france and other places uh the big pressure over here has been downy mildew yeah. um but we've really focused as a team on the vineyard we've been out there we've been meticulous about the canopy management this year yeah. keeping the vines healthy and um and as, as it happened, we've now been in a position where we've been dropping fruit. Yeah. We've got a lot of crop out there. And so we've been fortunate that we can drop fruit to try and focus on the on the quality. Yeah. Canopy's still green. Um, and we're just kind of finalising preparations for, for harvest now. And um, when do you think the first bunches are going to come off the vine? Any, any, uh... We're going to have some backers coming in from a grower, two growers next week. OK. Yeah. So um, backers is a great variety that isn't grown massively widely overseas yeah. but is increasing in plantings in England and one of the reasons for that is that it tends to ripen a bit earlier in the season yeah. the acidity drops off mm -hmm. it's a nice aromatic variety and so we're certainly finding that the Bacchus is kind of at, at, at ripeness Fantastic, um, yeah. and where we would want it to be so yeah. yeah so next week the uh the Bacchus will come in and then probably the following week we'll start bringing in the fruit from from Henna's because we're one of the earlier sites yeah that makes sense and for me, I, I sort of get the chance to uh, parachute in, I suppose, as a, uh, and, and, and come in a, after a few weeks and I see things that have, have moved on. So I, I've um, seen and have read these stories about, you know, maybe challenging conditions. But actually, when I would go more around the vineyard, um, I have to congratulate Will on uh, what a fantastic job he's done in terms of um, the, the fruit quality looks amazing. Um, they've got it's a really, really... Um, there's so much hard work that goes into making that. It's not when you have those magic seasons like 2020, which was a perfect vintage. It's kind of easy for people to make uh, great wines, and that and that the uh, the grapes just are uh, you don't have to do very much. But um, in the season like this, you can still make amazing wine, but it just requires a huge amount of work and expertise, and uh, you really sort of have to um, yeah, earn it, I suppose. But that's definitely what uh, has happened. So that's really really encouraging to see. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of um, any similarities with other previous vintages, have you got any uh, anything any vintages that might be similar to from recent memory? We are probably tracking kind of 2015, mm -hmm. um, which was again a bit of a cool season. There was a little bit of early frost. Yeah. Disease risk was quite high, but then we had a warmish kind of September late season, yeah. and so the fruit came in pretty right. There are some people comparing it more to 2013. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that the crop load was higher in 2013 and we didn't have periods of good weather, yeah. which we have had this year. Mm -hmm. um, it will be a cooler vintage in the yeah. grand scheme of things and it will lend itself more to sparkling wines this year, yeah. whereas last year really lent itself to, to stills. Yeah, um, but this year is going to be a real kind of focus on, on more of the sparklings and then some of the early ripening varieties like the Bacchus, mm -hmm. 
um, that, and maybe some Pinot Mernier in the rosé yeah. because it tends to drop the acidity close to ripening. Yeah. So that will be probably the focus on the on the styles this yeah. year. Absolutely. Well, I mean, from the wine GB tasting, there was um, quite a few 2013 and 2015 vintage wines around, and um, some fantastic quality. So I'm I'm very encouraged to uh, to see what these what these wines are going to be like when we get to taste them okay. next year and, and beyond. Um, so moving then to what's happening in the uh, in in this this winery and and, and the updates, I um, just want to bring in Rebecca and talk about the the cellar door plan. So we're not quite there yet. We haven't um, <laughs> got the, the haven't we've had some great visits so and uh, from from some trade customers and uh, starting to host people. Really really excited about um, welcoming anyone who wants to come really to the to the vineyard. So whether that's going to be uh, trade visits or members of the public um we're really excited about having that as an option but uh, whereabouts are we there with the cellar door preparation well as mike says there have been a lot of tastings done amongst the tanks amongst the vines anywhere we can get people um, but very soon the building's going to be going up we've got walls now we've got plaster going up and starting to see everything come together and how everything will look is amazing even just looking through the windows over that glorious view Colette mentioned we're over the Pevensey levels and it just looks beautiful out of what will be our tasting room when mm -hmm. it's come together um, all of that build's been going up really, yeah, really last fast, really well, last six months. You can actually follow it on our Instagram highlight. We've got all of the photos so you can watch the whole thing develop, which has been really exciting. Um, but it's not just inside that's being built up, it's the outside as well. So we're starting to see the pond being created into this beautiful area where we're going to have lots of wildlife, lots of different plants. We're starting to see plans for opening to the public when we'll have meadows with wild flowers, for example. Uh, and just to sort of touch on that, um, we've had the Sussex Wildlife Trust come along and they started surveying our ground, surveying our hedgerows. And I'm very happy to say we are in tip top hedgerow condition. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we have some fantastic wildlife out there, some really rare butterflies, uh, um, migrant hawkwing dragonflies, which are huge. I mean, you, they really are massive. They come and join you in the vineyard Amazing. as you walk around. So it's looking glorious yeah, fantastic. out there, yeah. And um when you have the, the chance for people to more people to come uh, come down, what sort of experience do you want people to have here? Well, I think that experience will be very rooted in the nature of the place that we have around here. So we have some quite close links to a naturalist, Thomas Buick. He features on our native grace labels and part of our self-guided experience around the vineyard. You'll get to learn a little bit more about him and a little bit more about the nature. But when it comes to it, it's all about connecting the people to the wine and the area. So everyone will get to taste everything. Everyone will get to yeah learn about us, learn about the team, mm -hmm. the yeah. site itself. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think that's really come through with the. Um, I'm sure you've seen the new design of the of the labels with the both the sparkling and the stills that reflect this sort of English hedgerow um, countryside, uh, very um, yeah very sort of rural image setting, and that was even though a, a label only tells part of the story it really is a little window into this is what it actually looks like and feels like it's a very calm place and the it's very green and um it's a, it's, a, it's a really lovely place to come and come and spend time even though we might stop to take it for granted being here every day um so then mm -hmm. moving from that i'd like to then bring in the, this theme of sustainability so um we are one of the founder members of YNGB's sustainability scheme and, and very proud of that and what does sustainability actually mean though Colette? because it's a much banded term and means things to different people and has different legislative terms as well but what does it mean to us? Yeah well uh, as I say we are one of the founder members um, it's really important to us here and to the wineries of, of Great Britain we uh, we're custodians of the land and we need to have as little impact on our environment as we possibly can yep. um, but uh, for us it's about looking at every kind of touchstone of what we do to see if we can reduce our impact so uh, it's easy to think about the the vineyard, um, but also in the winery, and then down to packaging and you know what weight bottles and glass bottles that we use. Um, so we're looking across the business to see what we can the, what we can do, and it's about continual improvement. Yeah. So you don't get the certification and then think that's it. You've yeah. got to set yourself challenges for the for the future. Um, in terms of the the vineyard, it's about reducing sprays. Mm -hmm. We are a conventional vineyard. Yeah. Um, it would be, it is a challenge to be fully organic in a climate like ours, um, but it is about reducing those sprays. So we've moved to mechanical undervine weeding mm -hmm. so that we're not using weeds, weed killers and yeah. weed sprays. Um, it's about um, leaf stripping and canopy management and keeping the airflow so that we use less sprays during the season. 
We've in we've got a rainwater harvesting tank, which now collects the rainwater, which we use for for operations around the the site. Um, so there's a few different things like that that we're using. Um, even down to at the moment, as we're coming up to the end of the season and the fear of botrytis, which is a fungal disease which can can affect the grapes, we're not using a botrytis spray. We're using a yeast based um, well, organism um, and product that will compete with the with the botrytis out there. So everywhere we're looking to try and reduce the reduce the impact. Really. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a guiding principle of everything we're doing here now. Mm -hmm. I think that really comes through in the sense it's not sustainability isn't one thing and it's it, as you said it's not tick a box and we've done it and and then then we just put it in a drawer and forget about it it's actually something that um gets thought about every day and every new practice and and innovations like that which um perhaps without without that scheme wouldn't have led us to have thought oh actually maybe we could maybe we can do this in a different way maybe there's a different product we can use or um a different technique and uh, so that's really encouraging to see and i think it again thinking it back to when we're able to stand out and, and, and look on the balcony in the tasting room and look over this fantastic uh, green rural landscape, you know, that sort of, uh, yeah, brings it all home that we live here basically. So, and we want the place to be as healthy and as vibrant as possible. And that goes hand in glove with the, with the wines that we make as well. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so um, though I'm sure uh, probably, hopefully all of you have tried uh, Henna's wines. Um, and um, if you haven't, we'll have to sort that out very quickly, but um <laughs> I'd like to uh, ask Colette about the henna style and to see what how you would describe the henna style now that English uh, wine is um, has come of age but is continuing to diversify and uh, producers are making different styles. How would you describe the, the henna style to to someone who hasn't tried it? So the um, so we've got still and sparkling wines. So the the majority of our production at the moment is is English sparkling wine, but we're increasingly looking to to, to do the still wines. And I think that what runs through both the sparkling and the stills is that we want them to be fresh, approachable, rich and textured. And we want them to have a, a sense of, of personality mm -hmm. as well, yeah. um, but a house a house style. So yeah. some of the things that we're doing on the sparkling, for example, is, is that the non-vintage is, is a true non-vintage. So, and by that, I mean that we are holding back reserve wines. We're using similar, we're identifying the, the sites that we want to go into the non-vintage, where we're, we kind of agree what the, the mix of varieties are that we want in there. Yeah. So 40 to 45% Chardonnay, that's the kind of backbone. Um, and then the 35% Pinot Noir, 25% Pinot Mernier. Mm -hmm. We feel like that works for us, give or take. Yeah. And what we really want is for, as we go through year after year, that that style is fairly is fairly consistent yeah. um because obviously that's what you expect from a non-vintage absolutely yeah. but then you have a little bit more leeway with say the the vintage wines yeah. where you don't make them every year but you still want that that backbone of kind of henna's really yeah. to, to come through and so that by that i mean there's the wines go through full mallow we want them to be fruit driven mm -hmm. we want them to have approachable acidity but not to be razor razor sharp yeah. um i want people kind of licking their lips with it really mm -hmm. A nice balance of fruit, um, aging from the from the autolysis, but nothing too too yeah, rich. Yeah. You don't want it to be too tertiary. You still want that fruit to, to be in there. Absolutely. Um, and the same on the on the still wines. Really, we want them to be approachable, fruit driven, um, and suitable to the to the style. I want them to be good food wines yeah. um, that you can you can sit down and, and match with, you know, great seafood and, and and things like that. So that's kind of where we're. Yeah. where we're coming and we're very much at the start of the journey you know mm -hmm. this new iteration of henna's really started from 2018 yeah. onwards um the investment that's going in right now is doubling winery capacity again we're working with other growers we're sourcing fruit from different parcels we're playing with barrels and tanks and and reserve wines so it's very much a, a journey that we're on and we're at the beginning of it yeah. really and so it's a an it's exciting time we know where we want to go but it'll probably meander a little yeah, bit on yeah, the absolutely. on the way, and then obviously you throw in the English climate, mm -hmm. and so best laid plans. Yeah. You know, we, we know where we want to go, yeah. but whether we'll we'll get there kind yeah. of yeah. this year yeah. or next year, yeah. we'll, we'll yeah. see. Absolutely. Well, from from my perspective, from the outside, I I um, really encouraged because I as you said, it's only really since 2018 that we've uh, started to be able to, or you've really been able to put your stamp on um, the, 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 these wines, and they. 
they're only going to improve and get better and they're already fantastic now so i'm really excited to see what is this going to taste like in two years and three years and it's this continual improvement and i think it's going to be absolutely amazing so um yeah it's the challenge about sparkling wines you do have to be patient yeah it still remains to be seen whether i'm constitutionally suited to <laughs> that level yeah. of patience yeah, yeah. but um yeah, because you're three or four years in, really, before you realise whether what you've done has worked. Yeah. And you just, you know, it's, yeah. it, it, is a, it is a challenge. It's one of the joys. It's why sparkling wine also captures people. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a, yeah, it is a, a, a challenge. Absolutely. And um, one of my favourite wines, and a wine that I think is uh, representative of, of Hennessy, but also of Boutineau, and the wider sort of way that Hennessy sits within the Boutineau family is the rosé. Um, what's the key thing about the, the rosé? What, what do you like about that wine? Oh, I love, I think rosé should, I think you should close your eyes and I think you should smell red fruit. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you can do that, then I think you've achieved it. And I definitely think that with the rosé that we've got at the moment, that then you can, you can do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and in order to do that, we do work really closely with our French uh, colleagues and obviously the French make amazing rosé. Yeah. So uh, we do benchmark quite regularly. Yeah. We pull in wines to taste. We want to make an English wine and it needs mm -hmm. to taste of England. Yeah. We're not trying to, to replicate wines from elsewhere. But equally, we recognise that these wines will be tasted alongside international 100%. wines. Yeah. Um, and so it's good for us to be able to taste and to recognise and be honest where we think these wines sit. Yeah where improvements can be made, where we can express more England, yeah. where maybe sometimes we want to rein in a bit of England. Of course. Um, you know, that's kind of, it is, it's really important. And we work regularly with um, with Eric and Guillaume um, on the sparkling and the stills to to reflect, yeah. to reflect that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also we call on, you know, we call Julianne in uh, in, in Boutineau and JD and Rhino in, uh, in South Africa. You know, the South Africans make phenomenal white, well, phenomenal wines oh, yeah, yeah. but we're a little way from from growing reds yeah. red wines at the moment. Yeah. so we tend to focus on the white wines um and you know we, we speak to them about building mid palate and texture and their use of oak and lees and batonage because they've got a, a lot of experience of that um and we're still kind of starting on yeah. on that so we do draw on the expertise of the the wider winemaking team that's for Definitely. sure one of the huge benefits i think of headers uh, sort of being part of the Boutineau family is that um, within the UK, obviously uh, people can buy English wine because it's a, a sort of um, it's the idea of buying local, which is which is great, and and people uh, that's definitely you know a trend. But um, people might buy the wine from down the road and be sort of quite emotionally attached to it. But actually, we as Boutineau sell wine throughout the UK with a big portfolio of wine from around the world, and if it doesn't stack up sort of price quality wise, then it's not going to work. So it absolutely mm. has to uh, be that premium proposition. And then, of course, internationally, where we work with um, our international customers, that all the wines are available from different markets. And um, when it works its way through through the export, it has to stand up as a, as a quality proposition um, so that people will, we don't just want people to buy it once, we want them to buy it, think, wow, that's fantastic. I'd love to buy this again and and and, and, and do that. So I think that's, um, that's really important. Yeah. And um, one of the other winemaking points, I think, is nice to focus on is the idea of dosage because actually the dosage here is quite low i think and uh, in general for the, the sparkling wines and i think that sort of helps with this idea of drinkability so that you um don't get overfaced sometimes um some wines if the dosage is, is a little higher i feel like they can be quite charming in the first class but you don't really want to go back for a second one so um what are your thoughts about the dosage and how do you achieve a sort of relatively low dosage with the sparkling um well uh, it's a difficult one i think uh i think we do try and keep it low i think yeah. you're right um but and the way that we're trying to do that at the moment is largely through the the balance of using some reserve wines in the in the wine making sure that we manage the mallow and the acidity mm -hmm. really well so that these wines have a nice balance of fruit acidity a little bit of oak maybe in there to soften the edges and, and yeah. provide depth and texture so that then hopefully you don't have to overcompensate with a high dosage yeah. to add to add something else not just sugar but yeah. you know the, the sugar in the dosage adds mouthfeel and roundness and mm -hmm. you don't really want to have you don't want to have to rely on on that yeah. to be able to do it so it's from the from the yield management in the vineyard really mm -hmm. all yeah. the way through how can we be building depth interest texture into these wines yeah. How can they be approachable two to three years in yeah. rather than eight eight yeah, years yeah, in, which absolutely. I think is sometimes the, the problem. Yeah. Sometimes you have young wines 
that need a higher dosage to mask the acidity or to add some interest, yeah. or you have to wait yeah, a really a long time, long time yeah. for them. And our challenge is to is to find a, a happier yeah. medium. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. No, that that totally makes sense. And uh, I think that's sort of the elements of winemaking that we don't always see is that there's something at every single stage and there's so many steps and so many decisions that get made um which contribute which happen you know behind the scenes and things that people don't really recognize small things going on in the vineyard and, and small things happening in the winery which is really important so i think we have a question can you just click onto the q a and the uh, yes yeah, and uh, um, uh do you want to read that out nate Hello, I had the pleasure of drinking the Native Grace Still Rosé last week. Fascinated to hear about the dominance of Pinot Mernier in the blend. When do you hope the new vintage will be available, um, harvest issues prevailing? Um, so, yeah, we um, the main three varieties that we work with, sparkling-wise, are Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Pinot Mernier. But as we've started to get into the still wines, um, we've played a lot more with Pinot Mernier, and it's the... Kind of the third variety, I guess, in in Champagne. It's yeah. sort of fallen yeah. out of favour, although yeah. I think it might be might be back a bit. It's coming back slightly, yeah. Um, but it's a really great. It shows a lot of promise over here. Personally, I think the Pinots grow really well on clay, and we're a clay site here, so there's a, a richness that comes through. Yeah. But for growing in England, it's a it's a cracking variety because it tends to bud late, so it often misses the frost. Mm -hmm. um, it develops nice it'll be the first even though it buds late it'll be the first fruit that we pick because it ripens quicker yeah. the acidity drops off and it has in england this really lovely combination of fruit fruit and floral aromas and so we've started to use it a lot more as the in larger percentages in the sparkling rosé and the, and the still rosé and where you've got the pinot noir has real structure yeah. often to the blend and you definitely need it in there yeah. the pinot mernier just kind of softens up the soften up the edges Brings a uh, yeah, a little bit of fun, a yeah. little bit of lightness to the to both the sparkling and the still wines. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's why we use Pinot Meunier. And um, well, we're we're, <laughs> we're holding our cards at the moment. Yeah. We're seeing what happens over the next few weeks. We're yeah. hoping that the next vintage will be available next spring. Um, all being well, we've got another couple of weeks to yeah. to go to bring the fruit in, and we're we're doing our best to get the fruit where we where we need it to be. Um, so yeah, hopefully next next spring. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's just part of the the, the nature of uh, uh, we are. This is we are on the limits of, of viticulture here. So um, and 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 there is there is uh, the vintages are really different. And that is a, an exciting thing. I think actually, um, it's not that every year there's going to be something the same. But I'm absolutely certain that everything that we make will be when we put in a bottle will be 100 percent proud of so um that's that's never going to change yeah H how does a season like this help you, you within the whole uh, sort of uh, section of ingredients of i suppose of putting together the hennis wines uh how does it how does it help yeah um well i guess we are one of the reasons for the investment in the winery is to is to invest in lots of smaller tanks and barrels so that we're able to hold reserve wines back so we've got some Chardonnay from, from the last couple of years in tank and barrel here, which we'll be able to draw on. And this year we want to start holding back the, the Pinots as well. And a year like this, it will be higher acidity. It's going to be fresher. Mm -hmm. So drawing on those reserve wines will be really great. Yeah. And then equally, you know, there was talk last year, because it was such a great still wine year, yeah. there was talk about whether there was really enough acidity to give some of the sparklings longevity. Yeah. And a vintage like this will mean we'll keep back some spark, some of the, the base mm -hmm. um, as reserve, and that will probably be a fresher style yeah. that will hold really well, and we'll be able to draw on that in years to come. And so, you want to be able to piece together um, the different bits from different vintages to smooth out that that variability. Yeah, yeah, okay. No, is that what you meant? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So there, they, that that is the uh, the benefit of a season like this is it gives you that uh, that that option, that blending option for the sparkling, certainly for the long haul. So yeah, um, and um, yeah, so. I mean, excited to see what they what they turn into in years to come yeah definitely um, we uh uh we did have another question but it didn't we it. did i think we had one about um will any of the wines be looking to be certified as sustainable um so the gardner street rosé is currently sustainable we are a, so in the in the uk you have to be certified both vineyard and winery for the wine to be certified as sustainable mm -hmm. And our Garden Street Rosé was from all from the Henners Vineyard, which is certified as sustainable and made at the Henners Winery, which is certified as sustainable. Yeah. Not all of our growers are certified yet. They're going through the process 
And so that means that other wines at the moment aren't able to be fully certified, even though they've been made at the winery, yeah. the vineyards aren't yet. So it's certainly something we're looking to, to do in the future. We're working with growers that we hope will come on that journey with us. Um, and it's a priority for us going forward. Yeah. Um, I can't say at the moment which ones will definitely be be certified and what yeah. and then it gets quite complicated because if you're using reserve wines from different years and pre-certification yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. it, it may be a minefield yeah. but yeah. we're working towards it um and as i say it's actually as much as it would be great to say it on the label it is about the whole ethos 100%. of being sustainable yeah. rather yeah. than just having it's, a stamp yeah, so it's much more um yeah. yeah it is yeah yeah um did we have a new question in the q a box though because i thought that there, there was one but it disappeared uh oh if anybody had a question that we haven't answered it's in public now mike so the oh, question it's... is from paco um which is one of his favorites is native grace brew uh, and i really appreciate the difference in the amazing styles what's the philosophy to follow on from this um it's been a vintage and then it's multi-vintage what does the future hold so um claire i guess it's a good a good opportunity to talk about kind of the move into um, non-vintage across the, in Rosé and, and our brew, really, rather than focusing down on native grace? Yeah, well, um, so, um, yes, although having said that, I'm now going to talk about native grace. <laughs> so um, native grace was, was imagined and created as a kind of premium, standalone wine. And I think, and as, as Beck said earlier, the, the labelling was inspired by Thomas Buick um, and we wanted to really highlight the kind of the nature and the things around around henners and the hedgerows. Um, and I think if we are 100 percent honest, we didn't necessarily know where that wine was going to go. We had parcels of wines that were really great and they were standalone and they didn't necessarily fit the non vintage programme. And they were premium wines that had something really special about them and we wanted to mark them as something separate. So that's where Native Grace came from. And it started as a multi-vintage. And then we had a parcel of really great vintage wines. And we're, but we've now decided that we're focusing on multi-vintage going forward for the Native Grace. And the big difference between a non-vintage and a multi-vintage for me is that the non-vintage might have 15, 20% of reserve wines in them. And it's based largely on a, on a vintage year where you draw in reserve wines. And we're using similar percentages in that blend for consistency purposes. So that if we take a non-vintage brute this year, in six months time, in 12 months time, in London or Singapore, that wine should be consistent throughout it. The multi-vintage native grace, though, is a, is a in the nicest sense, is a bit more of a free-for-all. Um, it's truly multi-vintage, so we're going to be working across three or four vintages of those reserve wines. We've bottled a, a specific blend that is currently aging that is like 60% reserve wines. So it's a real shift. It's older, richer. It has a different kind of pedigree to it. And those percentages will vary year on year. I don't feel the need that the multi-vintage native grace needs to fit the, the type quite as much. It's a bit more kind of freewheeling, um, if you like. And so each of those multi-vintage cuvées might be a bit different and we'll kind of explain them when they when they come out whereas the non-vintage brute is um kind of the reason that we get up in the in the morning is to make that the very best expression of what we what we can it's our it's the way most people will experience our wines in the first instance so the the non-vintage brute and rosé are our are our doorways to our wines and they're what kind of we're constantly looking at at, at, at improving them and bringing the, the henna's personalities to them and then as this the, the wines develop there is a clearer water between the non-vintage brute and rosé the vintage which is in a few specific years and then the multi-vintage is a they're very different beasts um for different occasions and different personalities so that's where the the kind of philosophy is is yeah. is coming from yeah. fantastic um, so I think it's uh, now's the time to, to wrap up because you said we would keep this to half an hour. So it's been about uh, 
um, half an hour of, uh, of discussion, but it was just really fantastic to have the opportunity to update you on what we're doing with Henners and all the changes and the improvements and the, the continuation of this story which uh, and this journey, which we're all absolutely uh, thrilled that you are on with us. Um, we, yeah, next time, hopefully, the backdrop won't be the whiteboard yeah, and spiders. We're, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna have a we're, we're gonna have a lovely backdrop with the views next yeah, time. We're looking forward to showing you the Pevensey levels, which are fantastic and picturesque. Um, and uh, yeah, we just really appreciate the support. So every time uh, someone gets a, a henna's in their glass, um, it really means a lot to us. And that these are really handcrafted wines that we really take a lot of uh, pride in. And uh, I think that. Um, team here deserve a fantastic, uh, yeah, uh, have a fantastic achievement in, in what they've done and are continuing to do. So, um, thanks very much. Anytime you want to get in touch with us, you're always welcome to uh, send us messages. Um, we're much more active on social media now, thanks to Rebecca. Yeah. Um, and um, or get in touch with your your account managers or whoever your contacts are at Food to Know. And if you're ever in the UK, you are very welcome then to to come down and see us as well. So that's a, an open invite. Yeah, please and, do. Yeah. Thanks very much for, for your time, everyone, and um, yeah, you we'll so see much. you another time.